When it started out, um, it went to athletes and coaches and said, what is mental toughness? And unsurprisingly, if you ask enough people, you get a load of different definitions. So it started out with that it's another name for desire, maybe about that trying hard, never giving in, then a constellation of mental skills, then this is the one that, um, that Lee put up earlier, um, the wordy one, I'm not even gonna bother reading it all, and then people talk about a high sense of self-belief, this unshakable faith, so my view is that the, the academics, and I include myself in that, have failed the practitioners because no one knows what mental toughness is. Um, everyone uses a different word and actually there's a stigma attached to it. So if you are not mentally tough, you are mentally weak. Um, and that isn't necessarily the best way to develop people. Um, so this, is, this was the seminal um, mental toughness study. It's done by a group of academics at Cardiff Met. Um, and they went and they asked a load of athletes, really good athletes, what was mental toughness? And, they, and so they had that, that, that's, that statement to start with and then they had all this it's underneath it. Um, <laughs> every single positive psychological attribute you could ever have in the world. So my view is you ask athletes what they think mental toughness is, they just tell you what being a good athlete is, what, what the psychological characteristics of elite performance are. I don't think, that's not to say that's not worthy, it's not worth thinking about, but anyone can name a load of attributes that are pretty important. How do we separate mental toughness from that? And why don't we get rid of this term? I know we're doing a conference on mental toughness and I know that that's probably not the most helpful thing to hear, but we don't use this word in rugby um, because there's a stigma attached to it, because no one knows what it means, because if you try and develop it, people do 78 different, different things. So does it do more harm than good? What if we stopped using it and we use a different term? I, I use the word resilience. I don't think there is a much better um, academic backing to the use of the term resilience. There's a much better understanding of what it is. There's a much better understanding of how to develop it. I think academics did a much better job of putting that out to the world. Um, so I use the term resilience. Resilience is the term that I think is, is, is best used. But I think you need to be really clear about what you're trying to develop. And I'm not sure we've ever done that really well from a mental toughness point of view. And then we went, right, well, something's got to underpin this, and it's, it's mental, so there's got to be something cognitive, there's got to be something neurobiological that underpins this stuff, um, to, a, to a theory called reinforcement sensitivity that was by Jeffrey Gray. And he looked at animal brains. He looked at rats' brains, he looked at mice's brains, he looked at how they responded to different stimuli. And he, and he went real simple. Animals respond to reward and punishment. There's different parts of the brain that deal with these different things, but... Fundamentally, every type of stimulus that you can present is either a reward or a punishment. So in animal terms, when he was doing his research, Jeffrey Gray, a reward is a piece of food, a punishment is a predator, the threat of dying, the threat of getting eaten. In golf terms, it's, it's more complicated, and like anim, uh, human brains are more developed than, than animal brains, but for the sake of this, your, your rewards are your birdies, the, the, the whole putts you're gonna make, the getting up and down, winning trophies, all of the stuff that comes with that. Punishments are all of these things, hitting OB, um, shanking it, missing a putt, um, especially when there's, there's the potential for reward around. So we're distinguishing between those bits and we know from Jeffrey Gray's research that different parts of the brain light up when these things get presented to animals. And we do have the same part of the brain as animals, it's just we developed a few more bits. When we're talking about situations where we want people to, to perform under pressure, there's both um, reward and punishment in the environment. So yes, I want to win a trophy. I'm Jason Day and I want to win the US Open or I want to win the PGA, but I also don't want to choke and I don't want to give it away and I don't want to be embarrassed on national TV, etc., etc. And that's where this system comes about the behavioral inhibition system, when there's both types of stimulus in the environment. 
Now in animal terms, what happens is the animal stops, so it, it inhibits its behavior, it scans its memory, um, it assesses risk, um, and, it, and it, that, that's what it does. And, and then the longer that situation goes on, the more likely it is to, to go to the avoidance. If that situation lasts for more than 10 seconds, it's going to avoid. The longer it goes on, that's what happens. But in human terms, this is the system that underpins performance under pressure. This is the system that we want to know most about. which is essentially an intervention to try and develop mental toughness in cricket. Um, so I, I'd want, as we're going through this, you to be thinking, well, what, what do you currently do to make your athletes more mentally tough? Um, um, in cricket, this was, our, this was our starting point. This is about 2007. Uh, Peter Moores is in charge for his first round in cricket and he's looking at our senior team and, and essentially they're not playing well under pressure. Um, they, they're not, especially in one day cricket, but they're not, they're not performing when, when they need to most. They're not making good decisions. And he said, I, I want our cricketers to be like this. I want them to make better decisions. I want them to be more physically and emotionally resilient. And I want them to have an attitude to train harder for longer. Um, so we started with a relatively young group of 17 to 19 year olds um, and, and worked with them around a program that was designed to make them more mentally tough. Um, and we started from a place where we went, if you're going to learn to perform under pressure, you better practice under pressure and stress a lot of the time. Um, and so we said there are crucial parts of this training environment. Um, the word punishment isn't politically correct, so we use the word, the, the word consequence. Um, we had consequences for, it was a central tenet of the program. We need to expose players to, to the threat of loss and we need them to expose them to distractions. This was a slide that we would present to them before they signed up to the program. This is what we're going to do. This program was specifically in its, in its first year designed to just me develop mental toughness. There was essentially no skill, at, skill element to it. It wasn't designed to make them more skillful cricketers. It was designed to make them more mentally tough. And there are three basic parts to it because crucial was that you had to expose them to consequence or, or punishment. But Essentially, it's like classic desensitization training. If you put someone in a box with a snake who's got a phobia of snakes, some of them learn to cope with that. More often than not, though, they get a learned helpless response. So if you want to avoid a learned helpless response, you better do the, well, our view is you better do these two things. You better equip them with some pretty good coping skills and you better deliver this, the punishment in a transformational way so they understand why they're doing this. Um, and so our whole program was based around those, those three bits. Most people, if they came in, would tell you about the punishment because that was probably the novel bit and we, we made a really big thing of it. But we were pretty clear that you had to do these other two bits just as well. So to go into a little bit more detail, the types of consequences, I'll be honest, I think we got this bit a little bit wrong in places. Um, we, we distinguish between disciplinary and performance consequences. I'm not sure our consequences were always the best consequences. I think we did this in 2010. Uh, Sam, who's at the back, is now with the WIU. He, he can potentially talk to this. Um, he was part of the program. He was the SNC on the program. But these are the type of things we did if you made a dis had a disciplinary con uh, um, error. Uh, so you rocked up late or you didn't have a water bottle or you weren't properly prepared for a, for a session. If you didn't perform to a requisite level in performance tasks, then you could expect this type of thing. Um, so again, I've put up the most extreme ones. Yes, we deselected one player from the program, or he wasn't, he, he wasn't allowed to go to India as part of the program. Yes, we sent players home, but we also did things like, the, the classic one was a five minute challenge um, with a guy called Floyd Woodrow, who was this army dude who, who would just basically flog people. Um, so there, there were lots of different bits. Like I said, I don't think we got that 100% right. I'm absolutely certain the SNCs in the room would go, we can't use SNC activities as punishments. They're going to start to learn that this is not what we want to do. You punish, punish people for not adhering to certain behaviors or certain performance standards. Yes, Steve. Who, who said it was? So we, again, we got better at this. By the middle to the end of the program, they were all set by players. So the players would self-administer these consequences. At the start, 
you're trying to in sort of engender a bit of a culture change. So there was a bit more of it done by staff or staff setting a certain standard. It only became, in my eyes, more effective once players were going, yeah, this is what we think. If we don't reach this level, this is what the consequence should be. Most people say players are more harsh than coaches. Players will, will definitely rinse each other more than, than, than coaches will. Um, this is the information we give them. It's designed to be unpleasant. We're not giving you consequences for a pleasant for a reward. That's the, they have to be unpleasant, otherwise they're not going to spark the part of your brain that we want to be testing. Um, and ultimately, if you fail or you don't perform well in international cricket, then there are going to be consequences for it. And it can be all of these things. And I've, there's some examples of golfers. That we could list thousands of examples of golfers who have choked under pressure. Um, but they are, when you mess up, it is career ending. It can be expensive. It can be humiliating. Um, so that, that was our rationale. But we tried to have some rules around the consequences. Um, so to the challenge and support bit that we talked about earlier, we'd only ever deliver consequences once we'd, we felt that we'd provided lots and lots of support, lots and lots of education. Um, we did have skill development sessions that were free of consequences, that where players were encouraged to explore. Um, they weren't a central tenet of this, pro of this initial program. We staff would role model consequences, so I had to do a fair number of five minute challenges. I, I had to wash dishes, whatever it might be, we, and we would police ourselves just as much as, as the players would. And to that point, we, try, we were trying to get to a place, and I think in most places we did through like co-captains. Co-captains would come and join us at the end of the day for a management meeting and go, right, what do you think, what do you think is worthy of a consequence today? Or what do you think should be worthy of a consequence tomorrow? On, some of you might be familiar with transformational leadership theory, um, but this delivering it in a way that so the players understood there's, there's seven or eight behaviours attached to transformational leadership. I'm not going to go into it in loads of detail, but we would role model the, the, the consequences. We would role model the type of behaviours that we want to see. That's one of the leadership behaviours that we'd want from our coaches, from our staff. We would always try and articulate a vision of why we're doing this. We're doing this because we want you to be the very best in the world. We want you to be top class international, world best international cricketers. Um, and try to inspire confidence that they could achieve that vision. And we would always, I don't think we did this bit as well as we could in that first program, but I would certainly advocate now there's not one size fits all. That Ideally, you should be tailoring consequences to certain individuals, um, especially in a sport like golf. But I think even in a sport like rugby, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for the way we did deliver consequences across a, across a whole squad. Um, We, we delivered it as an educational system, so we had some colours in there, some different psych skills. The idea was to get into a red state, to be completely alert, but I don't need to talk to you about psychological skills. You, 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 everyone is capable of doing it, and as Dan said, coaches are equally as adept at, as, as, as teaching this stuff as, as psychologists are. But that, that was what we used. That was, our, that was our way of delivering coping and delivering psych skills. So the, the sort of structure of the way we did it. So we would we broke essentially a 65-day program into four-day chunks. So our first day would always be a skill development day. It would always be a no performance consequences. Let's go and explore short pitch bowling and how you might deal with short pitch bowling. Um, loads of support, loads of experimentation encouraged. Then day two, we'd do pressure training, which is where they, we would introduce consequences, but we'd have a load of support. So the psychologist would be helping them with coping strategies. The, the coaches would be coaching them through that session, but there would be a consequence if they failed to perform. Day three was a testing day, so we do the high challenge but no support. So the coach, if you're if you're there, you're 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 doing nothing. You're watching as a psych. I'm not necessarily giving giving cues. I'm not helping out. Same with the coaches. We did encourage players to support each other, but the support from us would be removed, and then we'd review and set goals for the next four day cycle. And for the most part, we stuck, to, well, we did, we stuck to that four day cycle throughout that included a tour because we wanted to see whether it would work. It was a, it was a research project. Um, Sam was part of that program. I'm giving, the, I'm giving the sell, I'm giving the pitch on this. What, 
what was your recollections of that program? What would what would you tell an audience about that program from what you can remember? Goods and bad points. Um, I think the summary you've given is, I hope that's pretty accurate. Um, I think so. Just, I mean, a couple of comments then from what you put up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the fact you've emphasised the transformation of delivery uh, and the coping discussion support is really important. I think a lot of people. Forget about that. Latch on. It'd be interesting if people have immediate thoughts when they've latched on to it. Yeah. Probably gone. Like the punishment. Yeah. Bit, which, while it's a key tenant, only works with those other things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we were learning that for, 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 uh, for real. Yeah. We through it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think term we used was high challenge preceded by even higher levels of support. Yeah, absolutely. That's a term I use a lot still. Um, I agree with you that being able to differentiate individually better. So that you make sure that the consequence actually fires that punishment center in Absolutely. where we were getting a, a say a non response from someone that kept getting mm -hmm. okay, if we could be more sophisticated about that, you would be better off. Definitely. Um, but definitely definitely <clears throat> drove behaviour change. And I think the fact that in our program we wanted another real key thing was from like, the person in the time Simon Timpson in charge at the top. We were all committed to it, so yeah. we were going to see it through. And you knew that when you were going to leave someone out, or so we, you know, we left we left players out of uh, you know games in international tournaments because they hadn't bought the correct kit and things like that. And they knew that we were actually going to deliver on it. Yeah. That was key, and it's all very well um, challenging people with these things and saying you're going to do it, but at the last minute, not. So I think that was the strength of what we did, which is hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just just because I, I they really I completely concur with all of those points. Um, the the example to use Dan's let's let's actually put a story on it. So, for the first time, really, although Sam was a big part of it, we we tried to introduce fitness standards in cricket. Um, they weren't really around before. Well, they were starting to come in, but this was the first time we we had a tour to India, and we said, if if you want to go on this tour to India, you're going to have to reach this level on the bleep test by this date, and. Probably our second best batsman, definitely one of the, the top three, failed that bleep test and therefore didn't go on that tour. And Simon, if he was standing here, would definitely say that was the most impactful thing we did because that clearly changed people's behaviour and or view of um, view of the consequences, view of how we were going to toe the line. Um, I'd also say it's golf's a different sport. I, there's probably not as big a support staff as there is in rugby and cricket and. And, and football, but having someone at the top who absolutely lived this and role modelled it was pretty crucial. I, I think we would have struggled if we didn't have someone like that who, who was absolutely committed to it. Because it's pretty easy to, 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 to veer away from this. As soon as you develop relationships with players, you don't really want to do this. So, um, so I, I really concur with both of those, both of those points.